Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Every true believer wants to live a life that's pleasing to God, that demonstrates that he is a faithful disciple. And one of the things that assists us greatly in serving God and being a faithful disciple is prayer. Prayer should be the foundation of every believer. And we're going to see, and we saw last week, that God wants to say yes to our prayers, but there's a condition. And what is that condition? Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 18. The book of Matthew and chapter 18. Now, we all know this scripture, but the problem is this. Too many people know the scripture, but they do not understand the scripture. And what I mean by that is simply this. They hear the words, but they do not have the right understanding of the intent of Yeshua, that is, Jesus of Nazareth, when he said these words. So let's look again. We read this last week, but it's so vital that we understand what is the proper intent of Messiah. So Matthew 18, and look with me, if you would, to verse 19. We read, Again, I say to you that if two of you agree upon the earth concerning and pay great attention. Most Bibles simply say anything. And I shared with you previously, do you think that would be the fact of, of the word of God? That if two believers agree on anything, what does the rest of the scripture say? If two of you agree upon anything on earth, and if you ask, it will be done to them from my Father in heaven. Now, does that make sense to you that the key in getting something from God is simply if we can find another believer that agrees with us that whatever it is God's going to do? Of course not. God is holy. He is righteous. And over and over we need to affirm that it's his will that is perfect, his plan for my life that is the best. So it's not saying here that, that we are, are stating something, and if we agree, that obligates God to agree with us. And that's not what it says at all. The problem is this. Too many translations simply ignore a very important word. What it says here is that he will do to them if it is anything that is, and the Greek phrase here is pantos pragmatos. Now, what is pantos? Pantos is all, everything. But here's what we need to realize. That second word, pragmatos, is ignored by almost every English. And I check some other languages with friends that speak other languages, and likewise, they ignore it. Now, it's where we, in English, get the word pragmatic. And if you do a good word study of this Greek word, pragmatos, it speaks about something that, that investigates and seeks the factual truth, sees evidence, and based upon that evidence, responds in a way, and here's what's so vital, in a way that is in the interest of the one. What one? The one that the issue concerns. And the one here is God. We want always everything to be pleasing to him. So when it says pantos, pragmatos, it means everything that is 
factually, and this is scripturally factual, according to the truth, that is indeed the will of God. We need to agree, not that we want it, but that God wants it. Now, there's another important consideration of this text. And what is that? Look at the next verse. Verse 20. For where there is two or three gathered together, and don't ignore this next phrase. Wherever there is two or three gathered together in my name. What is the implication of the word name? And we're speaking about Messiah's name, his character. So if we've gathered together in a place, there's two or three of us, and we agree, then we come together in the character of Messiah. In his name also means for his purpose. So if we agree in his character, this is his will once more. What will happen? It says here that there I am in the midst of you. That brings his presence into that situation. And that's what we're seeking. We want Messiah to get involved. We're praying for his will, his purposes to be done. Now, let's move on to a new section as we move into the last part of chapter 18. Now, we've been talking about prayer. Prayer that is able to move not just any mountain, but the context that we saw several weeks ago was for the Mount of Olives. We mentioned that when Messiah returns, and I'm speaking of the second coming, his feet will land on the Mount of Olives and that mountain will move and this is going to inaugurate the kingdom of God. So when it says you can pray and you can say to this mountain, not just any mountain, but this mountain, it's all about praying in light of a kingdom desire, a kingdom purpose. And here's what Messiah is going to share with us now. In this last part of chapter 18, he's going to reveal to us something that hinders our prayers. And what is that? We know that prayer is, is effective. It is powerful. Prayer can bring great change, a transformation into whatever situation. But there is something that hinders prayer greatly. And what is that? when we approach God having a spirit of unforgiveness. See, everything that God does in my life begins with me receiving mercy, His grace, that one of the benefits of that mercy and grace is forgiveness. He forgives me of most of my sins, no. My insignificant sins, no. He forgives me of all of my sins. Isn't that wonderful? Is there anything better than being forgiven? Because that forgiveness, what does it bring about? It brings about through his great grace, his workmanship, what he did upon that tree. It brings about his forgiveness, the, the blessing of being with him in his kingdom, forever and ever and ever. It is also that forgiveness that it gives me a potential to receive the promises, the blessings of God, to be transformed into a servant, hopefully a faithful and obedient servant, thereby that we can carry out His will and receive kingdom rewards. Now, of course, there are benefits in this age, but if we have, and pay very close attention to this, if we have an unforgiving spirit, it is going to have a disastrous effect on our testimony, how we live, how God responds to you and me. So let's press on to, to the next passage. Look now to verse 21. Then, and that word is a conjunction, 
It unites, and this is why I say there's a relationship between effective prayer and forgiveness. If we don't forgive someone, it is going to adversely affect our prayer life. And when our prayer life is adversely affected, it brings about, once again, it brings about emptiness, it brings about a spiritual frustration, and it keeps us from, from having access to God's provision in our life. And we need desperately His provision. Not only His provision, but also unforgiveness. It, it makes impossible for us to have God's perspective because God is forgiving. So if we want his perspective, we need to as well be people who are quick to forgive. Verse 21, then Peter coming to him, that is Peter coming before Yeshua, Peter coming before him said, Lord, how many times my brother will sin against me and I will forgive him. So the implication is this. What is the limit that when my brother sins against me, I am obligated to forgive him? That's in essence the question. And the verse continues. It doesn't end. He says, until seven, meaning if he sins against me, seven times the eighth time that's it i'm no longer obligated to forgive him is that is that true is this the 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 fact of the matter and pay close attention to what messiah says go on verse 22 yeshua says to him i do not say to you until seven times but and this is in the, the emphatic. It's emphasized. Pay close attention. He says, I do not say to you until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, we know that 70 times seven is 490. And when I see that, that expression, 70 sevens, 490. You know what comes into my mind? Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 about those 70 weeks a week in that context is seven years for we're speaking about 490 years until what? Until everlasting righteousness is ushered in and we're speaking about the establishment of the kingdom of God. So what he's saying is this. The reason why he says 70 times 7 is to teach us that a kingdom heart, a kingdom perspective is one that forgives without any limitations. Did you hear that? Now, that's hard. It is oftentimes unpleasant to think of. You mean this person did this to me and I'm supposed to just forgive him? Yes. Now, that doesn't mean that, that that person is going to necessarily be a great friend of yours, that you might trust that person, you may not. But you can forgive that person even, even if they don't seek forgiveness. In fact, it is a wonderful tradition in Judaism. We, we frequently, if you join our weekly live stream called Midnight from Jerusalem, at the beginning of our weekly virtual worship service, we, we make a prayer in Hebrew, and it's called the Shema. It's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, He is one. And, and this is in no way in opposition to the Trinity. But here's the takeaway from that. We, we, we say that when we, we lie down in the evening, when we rise up in the morning twice a day. That's what the text says if you keep reading in Deuteronomy 6. And when we say it in the evening, there is a traditional prayer that accompanies the Shema, what's called Kiryat Shema Bemita. And that is that we say, God, please forgive anyone who has 
done something unkind, something wrong, sinned against me, please, oh God, forgive them. Do not hold that against them on my account. I forgive them. A wonderful way. I want to say that again. A wonderful way to end the day. It is only able when you are kingdom driven, when you have that kingdom character that you can make such a prayer and forgive someone as it says here, not just seven times, but 70 times seven. Now look, if you would, to verse 23. On account of this, and we're going to see that Yeshua, he's going to give a a teaching, a, a parable of such He says, on account of this, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man, a king, meaning a human king. So now he's going to teach us about the kingdom of heaven. And do you see how, within the context of this passage, the kingdom figures greatly? And you know what? It always does. So once more, on account of this, this this instruction about forgiveness, he says, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a human king who desired to settle an account with his servants. Now, this word for account is the word logos. It's in a different form, logon. But it's it's usually, for example, we all know the text in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, understand that this word, word in Greek, logos for word. It means, it's logos, we get the English word logical, but that doesn't mean necessarily that it's logical to you and me. It's logical in agreement with God's purpose, His will, His mind. In fact, many people teach that this word is like a a blueprint. The word of God is the blueprint, and then we're called to fulfill that. Go along with acting in a way for that word, for that blueprint to take shape and become the reality. So here we find that it's translated, that same word is translated as an account. So this human king, he calls together all of his, his servants and he wants to settle the account. Verse 24. But as he began to to settle, was brought to him one who owed 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents is an exceedingly, exceedingly large number. Let me give you an example. If you're familiar with the book of Esther, what's called Megillat Esther, there's that wicked Haman. And he deposited into the king, a man by the name of Ahasuerosh in Hebrew, he deposited 10,000 talents, this astronomical number. So we're dealing here with a parable. It's not a, a historical event. He's likening something. This is the language of a parable to illustrate a biblical truth. So there's this servant who owes this this king. He owes him 10,000 talents. Verse 25. But not having, he did not have to pay. Therefore, what did this king do? Look now, middle of verse 25. He commanded, this is his master commanded him that he be sold. Now, this teaches us a little bit about slavery. Biblical slavery is nothing, nothing related to that atrocity that that takes place, unfortunately, all over the world and plagued America in America's origin up to uh, the Civil War and really thereafter for a large, large portion of time. So this is something different. This is a man who has a debt, and the tradition was he could be sold, and not just him, but also his wife and the children, and all which he had, and to be paid, meaning that they would sell everything, enslave these people to to pay off the debt. Verse 26, Therefore this servant, 
falling, and it means falling down in, in begging, in, in a way of, of humility. So this servant falling, and the language here is, is begging, but it's also a word that's used significantly in the scripture for worship. Now, this just shows how, how this one is begging his master, saying, Lord, give me time, literally, uh, be patient with me, and everything to you I will pay. Now, the point is this. This is an astronomical large sum. He's not going to ever be able to pay it, but he has the intent. He wants to make it right. He wants to do the proper thing. And notice the response of this, this king, verse 27. But the, the master of the servant, the Lord, the Lord of that servant, being moved with compassion. So important, that expression. Moved with compassion. And we see that there is an inherent relationship between compassion and forgiveness. So the master of that servant being moved with compassion released him and forgave the debt to him. So large sum, he didn't do anything. The master simply forgave completely, wiped it clean. End of matter. That's what we see in this passage. Verse 28. But that servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarius. Now, a hundred denarius is approximately three months wages. A hundred days, a little bit more than three months, but a hundred days pay for a typical workman. Not someone who has a, a good job, but just a typical worker. So this servant who owed 10,000 talents, this great number, and compared to what was owed him, 100 denarius, this is relatively small. And what was his response? Look again. This servant went out and found one of his fellow servants that owed him a hundred denarius. And what did he do? Immediately thereafter, after receiving this great mercy from his master, he seized him, this one who owed him a hundred denarius, he seized him and was choking him, saying, pay to me that which you owe. In other words, not only was he demanding it, but he was physically physically harming this individual. Therefore, verse 29, his fellow servant falling to his feet, meaning falling to the feet of this servant who was just forgiven, this other, this fellow servant, fell to his feet and begged him, saying, notice the similarity, be patient with me and all I will pay you. Now, this servant might have had the realistic expectation that he could pay off this debt. The first one was, was not able to be paid. It was so large. But this one conceivably could. And he says, be merciful, or literally be patient with me, and I will, will pay everything to you. But, verse 30, this servant who had just received mercy and forgiveness, what did he do? But he did not want after walking away, now he gave orders and he walked away, meaning in the matter. He wasn't going to discuss it any further. And what was the orders that he gave? For this fellow servant to be cast into the prison until which he pays the debt. Verse 31. Now in verse 31, we see there are witnesses. There's always someone watching. And what happens? But his fellow servants seen, and what did they see? That which happened. And if you pay close attention here, it means that which happened previously, 
that which happened now, and they're thinking about the implications for this individual who is now on his way being thrown into prison because of this death. Verse, verse 32. Oh, excuse me, verse 31 again. But his fellow servants seeing all these things, they became exceedingly sad, and they went and they literally, this word means they detailed. They told piece by piece every detail of what happened to their Lord, that same master. All, and here's that same phrase, all that had happened. What happened? Verse 33. Then his master called him and says to him, a wicked or evil servant, all that debt I forgave to you since you begged me. Verse 33. Now, he forgave, and notice what he says. Is it not necessary, and that word necessary means, was it not absolutely necessary also that, that you be merciful to your fellow servant, as also I was merciful to you? Verse 34. And his master being enraged. Now, this is the normal word for wrath so his master was was full of rage and he delivered him over to and pay attention to this word now some bibles will simply say jailers but it's not just people who work in a jail if you do a good word study is the word for those who torture and this is important because see we're either going to be in the kingdom of god or being tortured in heaven or in hell, no place in between. And it says that he turned him over to the tortures until that debt was paid. That is, that he would pay what he owed him. Thus also, my heavenly Father, he will do to you. If you do not forgive each his brother from the heart, your heart, the transgressions. Some Bibles, modern translations, leave out the term, if you do not forgive from your heart, they forget the transgressions. But it's there in the biblical texts, in the best manuscripts. It's all about forgiveness from our sins. And because we have received that, we need to be forgiving people, and that forgiveness will empower our prayers. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.